James Silikowski, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. I am excited to talk about something that I know virtually nothing about, um, which is sharks. Yeah, well, I know a lot about sharks, and I'm super excited to, to tell you all about them. Cool. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't even watch like the, you know, the Discovery Channel shows. So I don't even, I don't even know what the myths are that we need to be busting. Um, yeah. I guess my, my, my first question is just sort of, you know, for you personally, like, how did you get into sharks? Like, you know, like, so for so many kids, like both of my kids at one point wanted to be marine biologists. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you are one and you're studying something tray cool. Like what was, what was the uh, journey? You know, it's an incredible one. I, um, my first sort of recollection of, of the ocean is when I was really young, like five, six years old. And uh, it's not that I can remember that far back, but you know, pictures of me at the beach and one of them, and this is in, the, in Texas and Gulf of Mexico was me on the beach beside a, a shark had washed up, you know? And at that early age, I just become fascinated with anything sort of to do with water. And, you know, as I went to college and in grad school, uh, it's always been focused in on that environment. I have always loved it. I mean, I was a kid growing up, uh, you know, I did freshwater fishing and everything you can imagine to be outdoors. And it was a, a great, just natural progression for me to, to, to be, you know, studying this charismatic marine species. Hmm. And you, did you have to like pay your dues and I don't know, study, you know, plankton and yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. man, it's, it's, it's funny because all my students that work for me or are interested in marine science or whatever, they're like, oh, I want to study, you know, whales or, or dolphins or sharks or something really cool like that. Um, but you do, you pay your dues. When I was a, an undergraduate in college, I, my research was on freshwater algae. So, hmm. you know, just getting that experience helped me kind of learn what was necessary to become a scientist. So although I was studying algae and not fish or shark, I learned the, the skills and techniques um, uh -huh. and that sort of catapulted me into what I would be doing now, you know, in graduate school, learning those sort of techniques. And, and um, yeah, it's definitely a process that you kind of pay your dues for. Mm. And I imagine that, you know, I mean, studying an, a species is all about it in context, it's ecology. So um, can you draw a straight line between freshwater algae and sharks? Or? Yeah, <laughs> not necessarily. But what was great is that the fundamental sort of how you conduct research is the same, right? When you come up with, you know, hypothesis, you test it. Um, and although, you know, on one hand, you're looking at a plant, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're putting together those methods, right? And you're learning a certain skill um, that kind of helps you down that path. And, you know, with sharks, uh, I still carry all those things that I learned, you know, um, studying algae and in ways that you need to be thorough. Um, and sometimes a lot of what you do, you don't like, or it might seem not to go the way you want it to go. But that path, although completely nonlinear, always get you to some sort of area, um, which is exciting. So what were, the, when you started out and as a, uh, an algae, a freshwater algae studying marine biologist, like what, what was the research agenda at the time? Was it just like sort of go in and learn about a species? Were there already um, like ripples around climate change? Cause I know that, you know, some, some friends who are oceanographers, yeah. We're like some of the first people to say, hey, weird stuff is happening here. So, I mean, that's a great question. I think that, you know, my experience as an undergrad, so you can imagine, you know, somebody who's, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old um, is still really learning the basics. And to be part of a, a professor's research lab was really exciting and, and daunting for me. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the students um, now, when they go to college, like, how do we get experience? And a lot of it's just, reaching out to that kind of professor uh, and getting those, those hands-on experiences. And it didn't really matter what it is, um, algae, fruit flies, sharks, you know, as long as you're getting those experiences. And for me, we really didn't see the effects of climate change until probably it really started picking up 
towards the end of my PhD um, when I uh, was just kind of finishing up. And now when you look back at what I did then, you know, this is, you know, back in, you know, 2003, 2004, all the research that I conducted probably needs to be redone because of climate change, you know, because of the shifting movement patterns and how animals are using their habitat. So, um, you know, it's frustrating, it's exciting, um, it's challenging, it's everything all kind of rolled up in one. Can you give me an example of a, a research you know, conclusion that you reached that's up in the air now? Or Yeah, so this is great. I mean, climate change, what people, it affects every aspect of like an animal's life. Uh, and some of the aspects that I was focusing on was life history. So how old do they grow? How big do they grow? How fast do they grow? All these sorts of things. Um, and climate change can have an impact on, on that. And so as the water warms up, uh, animals tend to mature quicker uh, mm. and at a smaller size. Um, and so now what you deal with is these changing life histories. And for a lot of animals in the ocean, we like to eat them, right? And in order to eat them, you have to do it sustainably. And in order to do it sustainably, you have to understand a life history. And so if they're constantly changing, um, then you constantly need to be updating um, your data. And so, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those constantly in motion type of projects. Huh. So sh sharks are mammals, right? Sharks are not mammals. They're not sharks, mammals. No, sharks are fish. Uh, and so there's a huge distinction. Um, and one is that a hey, sharks and other fish don't have lungs, right? That's a huge distinction. They have gills, So they breathe through their gills. And the other is that they don't have any hair. Um, and so those kind of things really, you know, are big separations between, you know, sharks and a marine mammal, like a seal or a whale or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, much, 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 much different. Okay. So, so they, they lay eggs. Some do. Yeah, some. some do. Uh, and that's part of what we study is shark reproduction and it's fascinating and it's complex. And you've got all sorts of different arrays of, of reproductive modes. And so about 60, about 40% of sharks lay eggs like a chicken, um, except they don't sit on them and incubate them. They kind of let them go and lay them and, and they're, they're gone. Um, then the, the rest of them, the other 60% give live birth. Um, so they actually carry the young like humans and like other mammals. Um, and within that, you get all sorts of different weird uh, ways in which mom cares for their babies. Uh, you know, the most rudimentary is that mom basically is the egg case and the eggs kind of dissolve inside her and the babies grow up with a, a yolk sac. And when the yolk sac's gone, mom gives birth. Then you have uh, a group that mom actually will produce eggs that the babies eat when they're inside uh, a mom. Uh, you've got a, a mode where actual babies actually eat each other. Uh, so intrauterine cannibalism, it's absolutely crazy. And then you have um, placental, like we do. So it's a very complex, um, which is exciting for us to study. Wow. So has, uh, if climate change has disrupted their life cycles, so they're maturing sooner, um, they're growing smaller. For, are, there, are there sharks for whom like motherhood or parenthood is like a big deal where they have to teach things? No, that's the thing. Um, and most sharks are sort of mobile, right? So they can move. And this is where the complexity of climate change comes into play. So for the species that are sort of stuck in an area, um, you know, animals, smaller sharks uh, or fish um, that really can't make long distance migrations or movements out of areas, they're stuck in that environment. And that's when their life history really changes, right? For sharks that can move, what they're doing is they're looking for more suitable habitats um, to sort of give birth in. Um, and so one effect of climate change is that um, these nursery areas where sharks give birth uh, sort of are in flux and they change. And so where one area might be pristine, sort of secluded, uh, is no longer habitable, right? Because of climate change. And they're looking for someplace different, which might be in an area of industrialization or hmm. high human impact. Um, and then you start to get in some really, um, you know, some issues 
along those lines. Mm, and by issues, you mean like beachside panic and so everything you can ever imagine beachside panic um also if you look at urbanization right urbanization can have negative impacts on environment right you can run off pollution whatever and so you know this area that might have the right temperature for that shark to give birth in um may not have the other components that are suitable so higher pollution <laughs> Can affect you know the, the that baby growth less food resources and so it's kind of a cascading effect. Hmm. Um, so what? So there's there's some sort of like uh, something brushing the microphone. Is that better? It's good now. It, it just okay. happened a few. It just happened a few times. Sorry. I think it was me touching the computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're very animated talking about sharks. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> What like when we if we see pollution, um, you know, I've been reading about you know various different pollutants and persistent organic pollutants and uh, endocrine disruption. Yeah. Um, can we, is are sharks sort of a canary in the coal mine species when it comes to the effects of pollution on sort of larger animals? Yeah, I mean, there one thing about sharks is that man, they've been around for you know over four hundred million years. Right, so they they weathered all sorts of incredible challenges environmentally. Um, so they have a really great, you know, resiliency to any of these horrible things that are kind of out there. Um, you know, there needs to be more more work done on sharks, but what we've seen is that they suffer the effects. Right, so you get sort of feminization in the males. Um, you get um, you know birth defects. You get everything that you can imagine that these disruptors would do um, does take place. But because sharks can kind of move, um, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing is that, you know, they, they're in environments that have different levels maybe of these toxins or contaminants. But what we're finding some of the major issues are is the sort of offletting of those organochemicals, whatever it might be from mom to offspring. So the babies, even before they're born, right? They've already got a buildup of mm. these contaminants. Um, and so, you know, for some species, that's a major issue. Can, you said like they can move. How, do you have any sense of if they know or how they can tell that they're in polluted waters? Do like the, the fish they eat taste bad or? No, no, no. So those are great questions. Some of the senses, I mean, the shark senses are absolutely phenomenal, right? I mean, that's how they are evaluating their environment. So they are evaluating temperature, they're evaluating smells, uh, they're evaluating the amount of prey items, they're evaluating the, the health of those prey items to a certain degree. Um, and all these things come into play when you look at the overall health of, uh, of those sharks in, in that ecosystem. Um, and so sharks play a really important role, right? And a healthy ecosystem has sharks. Uh, but if that ecosystem is already sort of decimated, um, sharks will move and they'll look for other areas. Hmm. So yeah, uh, for those who are watching on YouTube, there's a, uh, a picture of a shark behind you that yeah. rel relative to, it, to its dimensions has a giant eye. Yeah. Right. So tell us about that, that shark and why the eye is so big. So that's the poor beagle, and that's one of our um, that's one of our focal species that we study. Uh, it's an interesting shark. It's literally it's a it's a cold water shark, uh, and it can control its body temperature much like a tuna. And so you find these from New England over the United Kingdom, basically, and everywhere within their distribution, um, they're an endangered species except for the United States. Um, and their eyes are so big because they're an amazing predator. Now the poor beagle, it's, uh, it's related to the white shark. And the way I like to describe this to people is that if you took a white shark and a mako, um, mako is the fastest shark in the ocean. And, you know, a white shark is one of the largest, you know, predatorial sharks, put them together. You've got a poor beagle. Um, how, how do you spell that? Poor P O R. Okay. And then beagle B E A G L E. Like, like Snoopy. Like Snoopy. Yeah. And so that name came that it's porpoise shaped, right? Um, but it's 
a great hunter, like a beagle. And so they put that, those two together, poor beagle. And there you got, you got the shark. It's about a, you know, 11 foot shark. So it's not huge. Um, but it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great predator. It's fast. Um, we're finding that it is probably one of the most cold tolerant sharks in the world, if not the most, um, when all other sharks are leaving like new England and other areas, they stay, uh, for feeding and other things. So, uh, they're an incredible, incredible animal, but they go to these extreme depths. Um, so that's un not unusual for them to go from the surface all the way down to three to 4,000 feet. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a long way down. Um, and so they're, they're, uh, using these large eyes to, to find prey, to feed, to avoid predation. Um, and so if you look at other sharks, uh, the poor beagle, the other laminids, these white sharks and makos all have these giant eyes because they can go to these extreme depths uh, to sort of look and, and try to find food. Hmm. So you're a scientist. So there's places that you don't go in terms of like conjecture, but I'm wondering just in terms of like theory of mind, yeah. And like, can you, can you talk about like what it might be to be a shark? Like what would, yeah. you know what I mean by that yeah, question? No, 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 I hear you. Yeah, no, it's one of those, I think those, you know, medical, physical, metaphysical type, you know, thinking on, on how this animal lives and thrives in this environment. And sharks are, are, they are amazing predators and they're geared to be amazing predators. So the minds of a shark are, you know, finding food uh, and not being eaten or, or to the, the two main things. Uh, anything that's larger than a shark will, 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 you know, find it as a prey item. And if you think about, um, you know, orcas, sperm whales, there are a lot of things that, that are, have known to kind of feed and predate on, on sharks. So even if you're 11 feet long, other things that are looking out for you. So you are, are trying to find food, avoid food. You're using all of your senses, um, smell, tactile. They have electroreception. Um, they have great visions, you know, all the things that um, are just incredible underwater. And I say, I, you know, I say this to people all the time. Look, can you imagine, you know, going into a pool and trying to smell a piece of pizza? or try to find, you know, um, something without goggles under the water, it just doesn't work, right? And our ears aren't set up to hear anything uh, in any direction. And so sharks can do all those things and they do an amazing job at it. And so that's what they're geared up to be is these great predators out there. And the other thing is to, to find good habitat um, to do these things in. And they're constantly searching, constantly moving, constantly active um, to do this. Mm. So I know that you know one one of the ways in which humans have um, polluted the ocean is with noise, right? If you say they have this incredible yeah. hearing, what what is like what 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 are we doing in there, and what what effect is it having on sharks? Right, and so that's a great sort of segue into some of the work that's really coming into play over these last few years, is how um, these noises affect animals right who have these specialized uh you know senses of hearing and you know sound travels five times faster in water right so and it can travel you know you know miles uh and, and so people often equate to you know hearing as to you know a few hundred feet like like us and that might be pushing it right so it does affect them um and we're trying to figure out how like you know you try to go glean you know, green energy, right? Windmills, things like that. Um, you know, how does that affect, you know, not only sharks, but the food that they're trying to eat, right? And if the food in that area is being affected, they're moving or distributed or whatever, that's going to affect sharks. And so um, sound is a really important thing. And we, we're spending more and more research now trying to understand kind of how that is affecting, you know, even boats, everything, you know, it, it can uh, confuse animals um, out there. Has the pandemic year offered opportunities to, to do sort of natural experiments around that? You know, it's, it has, it has. Um, and it's one, some that we're working on because, you know, you had areas that, you know, a marine reserve or coastal areas that, you know, people were allowed to be in, but you couldn't fish and do other things. And so you take that component out 
now? How do animals sort of respond? And you know, anecdotally, uh, what we're seeing, you know, in some of the areas that we've conducted work, is a enrichment of life almost. Like they've come back um, to some of these areas in New England. You know, it's it's been a banner year for poor beagle sharks, tuna fishing, um, whale sightings. Um, you know, uh, sort of forage fish. So it's been it's been an interesting dynamic for sure. Hmm. Um, so you, I mean, we talk about noise. I mean, if there's there's sort of industrial noise. I think there's a lot of sort of military things. There's you know commercial and then cruises. There's like when I think about like who's making money in the oceans. Yeah. It's the yeah. It's those industries. Does your research put you at odds with them, or like do you get funding from them? Like, what's what's the relationship? No, that's a great question. So our research, um, I have colleagues that are that are working to determine those things, right, uh, and to see how windmills are impacting distributions. Um, uh, what's the sound impacts? Those sorts of things. Our research doesn't kind of go towards that so much our research really goes towards you know looking at habitat importance of habitat for animals at specific life history stages so where do mom give birth a lot of our, our work is focusing on mom mom sharks people don't really think about sharks being moms but they are you know what i mean so how, mom, how do you do that do you, do you like capture them and track them yeah yes multiple ways which is great uh and so capturing them and tracking them uh is ways in which we can do that and the problem has always been like all right here's a shark you know is it pregnant and so in the past the only real way to figure that out uh was to have to sacrifice mom right and look inside of her um but there's been an evolution of ultrasounds and so just like a human or a a, a dog you know female dog that would go to the vet uh we can now take this technology on a boat and we can look inside of a shark and we don't have to, you know, sacrifice her. Uh, and we can put a tag on her and we can track and see where she goes. Um, and we're also developing another type of a tag. It's got an intrauterine tag. And this is the one that's super exciting for us. Imagine an egg. It looks literally like an egg. Okay. Uh, and we insert this to mom in her uterus um, non-surgically just like a canal that we stick this thing in and this egg sits nestled with all of her babies. And when she gives birth and the babies come out, this tag pops out and floats to the surface and gives us a, lo a location where this is. And so this really is gonna help us find these areas that are really critical, um, these nursery areas and how they're changing with climate change and you know, watching mom as she goes on her movements, on her path, you know, how can we protect her in certain areas as well. And so this is sort of what our research does. And, and you asked about funding. And so we get funding from multiple different ways, but a lot of it is working through industry, private industry. Um, and one that we work with is, is Earthly. Um, it's a pet food company of all places, right? But they're about sustainability. We like working with sustainability focused people and companies um, who share our vision. And that drives a lot of our help in, in funding and in doing this type of work. Mm. So, yeah. So you're, uh, gosh, I have so many questions about that. I mean, just kind of like what, what it's like, like who goes and puts the tag. Yeah, on, I know. On the shark? Like, is that you sometimes? Yes. And so, you know, I have to say that these questions you're asking are, you know, for, for not knowing anything, these are great. These are amazing. Right. Cause these are questions that, that, resonate i think with a lot will resonate with a lot, a lot of different people so because of my role right at arizona state university i'm also a teacher a, a mentor and so my job is to not only study sharks and find out where they go and help protect and save them but also train the next generation of marine scientists and so that's an important part of all of this is training that next group and so my students go out and do this work as well. And so um, I have a student who just returned from um, the Dutch Caribbean doing some tiger shark work. I have a student in the 
and Exuma bah Bahamian Waters doing um, work uh, on Caribbean reef sharks, right? And so they've been trained now to get out here, right? And it's part of their research to do these things. And it's a process, right? Um, to make sure that this is carried on and continued and improved on. So just for kicks, like sharks swim really fast. They're really big. They could bite our limbs off. Like, how do you approach them? Do you, you know, like harpoon them with, with, uh, dark, with tran tranquilizers? Do you just yeah. like hold up a fish for them? And yeah, no. And, I, and I, I'm also hearing that I'm saying the word shark, like it's one thing and clearly it's yeah. dozens or hundreds. There doesn't, exactly. And yeah, you're right. Shark is a shark is not a shark. So multiple species, multiple sizes, and each one needs to be studied individually. And that's why the tasks that we do are daunting, you know, and take, you know, the help of industries to fund it and whatnot. Um, but imagine we're always evolving on what we do. And some of the things that we do are, you know, catching the animal. And so we have to, um, we use hooks with bait on it uh, and they bite it. And then we bring them to the, to the boat. And then we, um, we don't anesthetize them because that actually is bad for them. Uh, what we do is that we roll them over on their backs and that puts them in uh, a, what we call tonic immobility. So it kind of puts them to sleep. It's like, like a chicken. It's sort of like a chicken. It did this kind of just become really docile and they kind of lay there. Uh, so and have, we're able to- Do you have any idea why? Like it's, it seems we, like a weird- It is, isn't it? Uh, I think it's sort of like a, a disorientation type thing. Uh, whereas, you know, they're not, so, they're not used to being sort of upside down. And we've seen this too. Some of the sharks that we released, um, if they're still in that upside down position, they just sort of like kind of go to the bottom and kind of sit there. You know what I mean? And we'll have to swim down there and, and turn them up on the right way. And then like psh, they snap out of it and piano, they take off. It's, wow. it's, it's absolutely amazing, but that allows us to, to work with mom, um, without hurting her. Um, and that's the, our, one of our biggest concerns is her health. You know, I mean, she's carrying babies. And so we want to make sure that she, her and her babies are, are safe, um, as well as the humans who are, who are you know, doing that. So it's a, it's a big process. And everything that we do, everything that we, how we handle the animals has been approved um, through our university vets and our research integrity systems. And so we don't do anything until everybody says, you know what, this looks safe for everyone. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one aspect is we have to actually, the, the tags go on like mom, like, a like an earring on her fin. Uh, and so we kind of drill into that, drill into there, we attach it and then we send her off. And then after a couple of years that those, uh, the nuts will fall off and so does the tag. And so she, she loses her earring, but over those two or three years, however that long that tag stays on, we get some really good movement data from her. And so that's the one thing, but now we're developing these other uh, technologies. And one of them is this underwater ultrasound, right? So we had to catch mom and, you know, we've got an ultrasound and we're probing her, you know, and doing all these cool things, but now we can be underwater, right? And as she swims by, we can see if she's pregnant or not. And so this helps us understand ecotourism, dive sites. How are they being utilized? Are they important, you know, for moms? Um, and those, this is a, an, a, an area of our research, which we're trying to build, um, uh, you know, for the, you know, sustainability of, of all sharks. Hmm. So you have cl very close encounters with, with these creatures that are so different from us. Yes. Do you, do you ever feel like there's a connection? Like, I know it's hard to imagine like what yeah. their cognition is and their reality is given ever, all the differences, but like. I'd say, you know, just there is a connection the connection i think is is all right that you have this just incredibly powerful animal right that could eat you at any time mm -hmm. you know but chooses not to because we're not on their menu you know they're not this crazed eating machine that is on a you know vengeance to to eat anything that it's in its sight i mean in some of our work with this underwater ultrasound and getting it um you know field tested we're still working with it is i'm we're down with these you know 12 foot sharks you know 13 foot you're shark. not you're, you're not in a cage I'm not in a cage and they're swimming next to us swimming around us i mean as close as you can possibly get 
and they have no interest in taking a bite out of me. Um, and it's just amazing to be in their presence. It's terrifying, right? Because you know, they could, if they wanted to, there's nothing we could do that, that they don't choose to do it. And that's part of, you know, our message is that, you know, sharks are polarizing. People are, most people are terrified of them. Some, you know, are on the other end, like, wow, they're amazing and we love them, but there's not a lot of in between. And so we try to get everybody in between and understand how important sharks are. They're not this terrifying animal that's going to eat you, um, but they're really important to the ecosystem. Gotcha. But ha has, has there been an increase in shark attacks or is it just a question of, you know, whenever like man, you know, man bites dog? Yeah. It, sensational. It's yes. It's all sensationalism. I think if you go back and you look at, um, you know, the last probably hundred years, um, you know, globally, there's around a hundred, we call them interactions um, or so, you know, on a max year, maybe 150. And of those, you know, you're looking at under, you know, somewhere between five and 10 that are fatal, right? Globally, right? And, you know, if you take a second step back and just look at that, you know, that they're, they're not they're, they're, they're not seeking us out as, as food items because there's millions of people, hundreds of millions, maybe even a billion people that go in the ocean worldwide, right? And you've got, you know, 100 interactions. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, and I love throwing this stat out. You know, in, in New York, 3,000 people bite other people on subways. <laughs> you know, so if you're in New York on a subway, you got a decent chance of somebody biting you, right? Whereas, you know, globally, you know, about a hundred, you know, bites uh, occur uh, from sharks. Um, and it just, you know, just, it, you know, it, it doesn't really happen. And, you know, oftentimes it's mistaken identity in the wrong place, wrong time, you know, mm -hmm. more than not. And, you know, sharks aren't out there to attack us, right? Uh, they're there to feed and to find food. And a lot of what they do are, are exploratory bites. Um, and, you get people who are who are bit uh, on the leg by a five foot shark, um, but you know when a razor sharp tooth goes through our skin like you know hot knife and butter, it leaves marks. Um, so it sensationalized big time. See, so you mentioned that like the the main focus of your work is to protect and save the species. Um, I'm curious whether you think your work is helping and if so in what way like you know given the human propensity to destroy and and neglect yeah like is is the knowledge that you're creating moving the needle anywhere and if so where and how no those are those are great great questions i would say absolutely you know the work of what we do and you know the work of our colleagues are are helping us understand um not only where sharks are going and why habitats are important, but also mitigating some of our interactions with them. Um, a lot of what we do is we look for, you know, helping the fishing industry, right? You know, if a shark is caught and it's illegal or unwanted, it has to be released, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're looking for ways in which we can develop better handling practices, right? Or areas, hotspots, where we can avoid shark interactions at certain times of the year. So those things are really helping, you know, shark populations, um, understanding which animals can be commercially harvested and which ones can't. Um, it's a big part of it too. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's all related to our, a better understanding of, of individual species. Mm. But, but I might say, you know, cynically that for, that for most industry, their goal is profit, and you know I I haven't finished Sea Spiracy. I don't know if you've seen yeah yeah the movie yet, yeah. There's a scene up near the front where, where there's a type of shark I think in in Japan where it's all lip service about saving it, and they're yeah, yeah. you know yeah um, absolutely no you're right, and so I can speak from a United States standpoint. We do our National Marine Fisheries Service, our, our federal government does a really good job of regulating what happens in the United States. Um, and 
we've actually had shark species on the um, increase, which is which is good. Um, and now it's you know how do you how do you manage that increase when when you know uh, you know versus other species that are out there, and that's a good complicated thing to have to worry about, right? But you're right, there is a lot of lip service out there. There there are certain countries, there are certain areas in which you know it is about profit, right? Uh, and that's a major problem. And, I, and I'll tell you what's complicated about that is this, is um, for some of these countries where it's artisanal, right? And they depend on that resource to feed their families or to support their families is where it does become complicated because, um, you know, if some of those species are on the decline, what do you tell, to that, what do you tell them? You know, how do you get that message to them? But if you continue to fish, you won't have anything, you know, but that's the, that's the hard part because they're looking at right now, how do I feed my, my, my family? And so working with, with those groups is really important as well. So it's, it's a, um, it's a complex matter, particularly when you get outside the United States. Hmm. Yeah. And so you mentioned, you know, that you work with, uh, with earthly and, you know, so let's, we'll say that's the, uh, the great white in the room. So this is, this is a podcast um, plant-based. There's a lot of my listeners who are vegans, ethical vegans. And so you're saying that par part of you know, conserving species involves catching them, killing them and eating them, right? Is that, is, is that kind of the only way, do you think? Uh, uh, I would say that preserving them, you have to understand, it's complicated. You have to understand the biology for number one, right? And if you can understand the biology, you can get a better understanding of, can you fish them or not, right? And for some species, you just, they're, they're at the stage now where you really can't. Uh, and, you know, those are either no take or other very strict management measures are, are put into place. Um, on the flip side of that, you have some that are doing really well uh, and that they can be harvested um, and used for all sorts of different things, fertilizer, dog treats, food. Um, and that's the goal when you have something that is utilized, right? Is that there's no waste, that it's fully sustainable um, and that it's utilized as a, as a resource um, in any way that it possibly can. And I, I'll give you the example is dogfish. Uh, one way in which you manage an, a population is you set a quota. For how much can be taken out, right? It's just like farming or, you know what I mean? Anything, there's always like some sort of quota or how much land you can use. Um, and for dogfish, the quota right now will say is 30 million pounds that can be removed from the ocean to make it sustainable. Right now that fishery only removes about 16 million. So half of it is still not even removed from, from that quota. So the, the other 15 is remaining in there. And so we are trying to figure out ways in which, you know, that underutilized species can be better utilized. Um, take pressure off of individuals or other species that, that can't be utilized. And I think that's a lot what we do. But we also, you know, what we're interested in is finding alternatives to that, right? So seaweed, for example, or kelp, you know, what can that be used for? You know, and it can it take some of the pressure off of, you know, dogfish and go a different way. And so, I think all these things are an important part of the complexity of what, what we are constantly kind of working with. Hmm. Yeah, to, to my untrained ear, 30 million pounds sounds like a lot. And, you know, I'm thinking about as, as a gardener, if I just keep, you know, planting seeds, harvesting, and I don't give back to the soil, it's going to be depleted, is, you know, in the past, humans who ate fish lived on the coast right and presumably you know they would poop and die and eventually all yeah. the nitrogen would get back yeah. like is are we in danger not just of overfishing by decimating populations but actually removing you know messing with the the nutrient balance in the oceans right and that's a that's a really good point i think part of it too is is when you look at uh most of the management strategies now are going to from single species management. It's like, how do we manage, you know, species X? How do we manage species Y and Z 
but how do we do an ecosystem based management? What do we need for that ecosystem to stay balanced? So for example, let's say you have, you know, a plant that's really important, right? Then you have fish that are eating, might eat that plant. Then you have the fish that might eat the fish that eat the plant and so on and so forth, right? Now, if you remove that plant, right? You destroy the ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. if you, you know, remove the predator that's controlling everything at the top, then you'll mess up that ecosystem, right? And so finding that balance is really important. Um, and that ecosystem-based management strategy right? Make sure that, you know, you don't over harvest one, right? Which will cause a cascading effect down that um, tropic level or ecosystem. All right. Of course, my, my hackles go up a little bit when you talk about, you know, management at all, right? Like the world has done fine without us for, oh. for millions of years. And now, yeah. we're, you know, it's a little hubris to say, well, now let's go in and manage this. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, I, honestly, this is a funny thing you brought that up. I was just talking to my wife about this this morning, you know, um, and you're right. You know, we humans screw things up all the time, you know, and I think the strategy of trying to bring some sort of balance back, you know, to our whether it's agriculture, you know, fishing, it, you know, to bring some sort of management to, to those resources from an ecological standpoint, I think is the best we can do right now uh, mm -hmm. as far as looking for some sort of stability in, in these things. And we've seen populations crash, um, which we're learning from our mistakes and we're understanding it better, but climate change throws a wrinkle in all these things. Right. You know, once you think that you've got something in balance, all of a sudden climate changes and you've got species moving in from the south to the north, you know, you know, being competitors now, uh, maybe an invasive species. And so this will be a constant challenge for us um, until we start to, you know, make some changes uh, as a humanity. You know what I mean? Mm. Well, and, and, you know, we think about what what we're managing and for whom it's typically for either shareholders or voters. Yeah. Right. That, that you know, that when there's a species that, we, that scientists say they want to save and they can't articulate, you know, what's in it for me, you know, like the snail yeah. darter or the, you know, the Amazonian tree, whatever. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not a lot of public support for it. The, the, you know, and what's even more frustrating on top of all of that, right, is that we're advocating for that darter or for that species of shark, or whatever, you know, on a shoestring budget, right? And that, you know, we're, we're, you know, basically duct taping stuff together to get the, this data out, um, which is really important, right? And getting that to the masses and for sustainability and for saving species. But that can, it's, it's very frustrating to us um from multiple different standpoints mm -hmm. so what can uh, ordinary people do who are not you know putting uh, interuterine eggs into sharks and swimming <laughs> and advocating you know joe and jane consumer yeah are, are there things we can do in our personal life yeah I, there's there's and we i often get this question you know i'm from arizona why should i care about what happens in the ocean you know or, or I'm from Wyoming, why should I care? We're all related, right? We're all connected, right? Look about the carbon footprint. What can you do as a human being to reduce the carbon footprint? You know, what can you do, right? That's, that's step number one, right? And changing your lifestyle gradually, right? Is something that could have a major impact on, on the environment. Find a group, an organization, an individual, right, that you connect with, that you could support their work, right, make a donation, right, um, maybe it's monetary, you know, maybe it's, hey, you know what, I got a boat, I'll take you out for free, you know, I've got a place on the ocean that you could stay in while you do your work, you know, the, all those things help, right, but find, there's a lot to choose from, and a lot, you know, 
are what are they doing right what are they are they actively doing something are they training the next generation are they you know going out in the field to actually collect the data that the government uses or some other entity will use to make decisions and policies right find those individuals support them i think and that along with you know making um you know individual lifestyle changes is i think what we really need hmm. so there was a report that came out i guess yesterday's in today's paper about uh, a, a climate report right that was like basically the world's on fire yeah. um i imagine you're you know getting those bulletins well before the rest of us do you have confidence or hope or you're making predictions or just like you know damn the torpedoes and i'll do the best i can like where's where's your heart in all this yeah you know my heart is that we will make change that's my heart you know that you hope that that is the action that's going to take place you know right now when you see everything that's going on it's it's hard right to to be looking at it from your perspective, right? When you're reading it in the newspaper, but also to be living it, right? On the ocean to actually see it in, the, in, in our research. So I think that, you know, reading these new papers and this stuff, you know, we damn the torpedoes, man, I think is always in the back of everybody's mind. When, when are we gonna, when are we gonna make the drastic changes that we're gonna need to do? What are, what are we gonna do in order to, to, to get, us back on a normal track. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I know it is, isn't it? I mean, it is, it's, you know, it's frustrating, you know, for sure. The area that I study, one of the areas I study is the Gulf of Maine. It's warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world. So hmm. it's, it's, it's a scary thing. So, yeah, I don't think so many people who listen to this podcast are climate deniers, but you know, I live in North Carolina. I'm surrounded by them. There's plenty all over. From your, you know, we can read the reports and the studies. Like, can you talk about from your perspective, from your, behind your eyes, what you have seen that says this is real and it's a big problem? I mean, look, you've got great like you said, research that's out there. I mean, unequivocal, right? I mean, the Gulf of Maine have been studied, you know, by the Gulf of Maine Research Institute for tens of, you know, years. And they've got great data that's shown it's warming like it is. We see species, you know, in areas where they shouldn't be, right? We see warm water species in the Gulf of Maine, right? Where it's, you know, it's, these animals should be shocked and, and dead but yet they're there, right? We're constantly seeing this gradual movement up range expansions of species, range contractions of those that can't move. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, their area of habitat. And eventually what happens is that they, you know, become extinct, right? And so, I mean, this is all over the place, you know, not just the Gulf of Maine. So, you know, for us, it's, 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 it's frustrating, right? To see a lot of the stuff go on um, and some of these slow reactions. So we'd like to see, you know, this change, you know, we'd like to see, um, you know, us working together, you know, not only as a, you know, a United States community or North Carolina community or Arizona community, but, you know, a global community. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's talk a little bit about earthly, just so my, my, my vegan listeners can have a sense of of where you're coming from and how actually eating fish, eating sharks um, can be compatible with, with uh, saving them. Um, a lot of vegans I know have cats, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't think those cats can be vegan. <laughs> no, I don't think so, right? Um, and so Earthly is a great example of, you know, a company that's about environmental consciousness right and sustainability um and moving away from using species that aren't so sustainable right or maybe questionable and a good example is you know this dogfish treat that that's being developed 
is taking the place of a cod tree, you know, which, um, you know, that species is, has said has had some issues over the years and so looking for different ways in which to fully utilize things different products different species is a really important when you talk about sustainability and eco-friendly and we really like that about earthly and this is sort of why you know we're like hey this is a good company they kind of see our vision um and you're right it's also nutritious it's also also well balanced things for our pets. I can tell you our dogs, we have a pug and I have a um, Boston Terrier and they absolutely love the, those, like the dogfish treats um, that they did the sort of like a, a preliminary, you know, product review of, and it was phenomenal. They loved them. Um, and it's something that would have been tossed out and thrown away. Uh -huh. So just to be clear, the dogfish isn't just for dogs and catfish isn't just for cats, right? Those exactly. Are, yeah. Yeah. They weren't named for that. No. Uh, and so the dogfish actually is, it's, it's, gets its names from the spiny dogfish, which is this, uh, the most ubiquitous shark species there is um, literally in the world. It's found all over the world um, and uh, super resilient, very sustainable very well managed uh, in the United States um, when I've been studying for 20 years. Mm. You mentioned at the beginning that you're studying life cycle and I'm curious about longevity mm. of different shark species and how it's, how it's been affected by climate change. Right. Um, and so some, I mean, like highly variable on the species. Um, you know, you've got, you know, Greenland shark, which is purported to be 400 years, right? I mean, that's that's like an oak tree, right? <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and then you have other species that, you know, don't live quite as long, some, you know, 12, 15 years, others, you know, in the 50 year range. Um, climate change, we're still figuring that out on how it's affecting longevity and overall sort of like growing old, right? Where climate change is having its the most impact is the finding suitable habitat right and if you can't find enough suitable habitat then that will drive down population sizes right um and those are some some of our most major concerns right now when you talk about climate change mm -hmm. but if these animals are, are are living these long lives right you know and they're constantly in in the stress right of different temperatures, they have to spend more energy on metabolism and other things, it's going to affect growth. It's going to affect longevity. And I think at some point, if we don't change something, it's going to really catch up to a lot of these species. Hmm. Are, are there social shark species? I mean, that's a really good question. You know, I'd say yes and no. Um, sharks tend to form these sort of loose aggregations in a sense. They're kind of all around, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, in an area that's got a lot of resources and whatnot, but they often don't come together very often. You have some species of reef sharks that will, you know, kind of congregate um, at certain times of the day, right? And then feed at night, right? Disperse, come back, disperse. Um, spiny dogfish, right? we'll go back to them. They get their name because they travel in giant packs like a dog. I mean, giant packs, like you're talking tens of thousands at once, just sort of moving together, right? Uh, wow. And you have others that are uh, much more solitary, um, you know, um, and trying to kind of do their own thing. So um, yeah, it's a fascinating, sharks are fascinating and, you know, from just about every angle that, that you look at. Gotcha. The, so, the more or less social ones, do we understand how they communicate with each other or if they do or what they say? You know, again, what we understand, it's, it's gesture, like body sort of gestures um, and uh, ways in which they're presenting themselves, um, sort of like scrunched up, this sort of aggravated, right? Um, you know, swimming erratically like around an area, very aggravated or agitated. Um, there are some species of non-sharks but still within that group right stingrays uh and whatnot that communicate through electrical impulses um i'm not sure if that's been shown in sharks yet 
Um, they also do a lot of pheromonal, um, hormonal stuff, you know, mm -hmm. senses, things like that. So, um, but as communicating, you know, like, Hey, what's up, Joe? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. What about in terms of mating? Do they have dances or pheromones? It's pheromones for sure. Um, and I would say you could say kind of like a dance, uh, whereas mating in sharks is a extremely, extremely violent. Uh, the male has to actually, they have internal fertilization. And so males have these two copulatory organs. They stick out from their um, pelvic fins. They're called claspers and they insert those into the female. Uh, and actually inject sperm and it goes up and it fertilizes her eggs and she gives, you know, develops either an egg case or, uh, or, or, or a baby that she gives live birth to. But the male has to pin her down. And so imagine their sharp teeth, right? Females will develop skin that's, you know, up to three times thicker than normal during the mating season. Um, she's got bites all over her, all beaten up. Um, and so males and females tend to stay apart. They segregate until mating season typically um, mm. because of how crazy and violent that is. And some of our work in the Bahamas on tiger sharks has kind of shown that, you know, there's this area that's um, a female aggregation site, you know, to sort of exclude kind of males potentially um, for safety, for lack of a better word. Mm. So I guess you, ne you never go down there wearing a shark costume during mating season. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. <laughs> wow. And that's that's so interesting because it's, you know, when we think about how we want to portray animals that we want to save, we want to make them real cute and cuddly and, yeah. you know, anthropomorphic. And, and there's this kind of un inconvenient detail. Yeah. <laughs> they have big teeth. Yeah, exactly. No, it is. It, and it, it goes back to, look, they serve a purpose, right, in the ocean. That purpose is to, in reality, keep other populations stable, uh, keep ecosystems in balance, and they tend to eat the dead and dying, right? So they make the other groups more fit. Um, and they, they eat the dead and dying because they're easier to catch. Easier to catch. Sharks are kind of lazy to a certain degree. You know, it's like us w wanting to cook a, you know, a, a five course meal. It sounds amazing, right? But if I can go to a restaurant, you know, and get the same thing. Why not? It's the mm -hmm. same kind of concept, right? To eat the dead and the dying, a lot less energy, a lot less chance of being injured too while you're, while you're doing that for a lot of those species. So they love to the scavenge, you know, and, and eat stuff. Huh, very cool. Any, anything else I haven't asked about that do you think people need to know about sharks? I think that, you know, the, just the concept of, you know, they are not, we are not on the menu. They're not out there to, to sort of eat us. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in the ocean and you're kicking around and swimming, you're probably surrounded by hundreds of them, right? And they just have no interest in us. Um, and that if you're really worried, just don't go all out at dawn or dusk. Don't go swimming in areas that have um, a lot of the prey items. Don't go swimming near a seal colony or in a school of fish. Um, and don't go all by yourself, you know, at those times. Uh, and you can significantly reduce your chances of any kind of interaction. Got it. Good, good advice. Uh, if people want to follow you and your work, where can they do it? So they can go to Instagram or Facebook. It's uh, Sulikowski Lab or at Sulikowski Lab or um, my website at Arizona State University um, as well. And so a lot of great information about what we do how we mentor the next generation and the research projects and how they can get involved, you know, and help donate and whatnot. Great. I'll put those links in the show notes. And uh, if people want to find out more about Earthly, where do they go? They would go to Presidio Pet. Um, and that would be the link that would take them and learn it. So Presidio is, is an Earthly or same parent companies. Um, and I think the Earthly may have just started their, their own website. So they can probably Presidio Pet or Earthly would, would take them okay. to the, the understanding of those. So companies. it sounds like a Google search for Earthly would be good. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much. I've, uh, from, from starting out thinking they were mammals, I think I've learned a great deal. 
<laughs> yeah, no problem. If you gave yeah. me the test you gave your uh, your ASU freshman, I, I might pass now. I think so. I tell you, your questions are really good, inquisitive. So I'd have, I, I, you'd probably be in the, uh, the A range. <laughs> Sweet. I've always been a great grubber. So I might get something <laughs> out. James Sulikowski, thank you for all you do, for sharing it with the world and for taking the time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a pleasure. Me too. Thanks. Bye-bye.